The universal mind is so wonderful that it's difficult to understand its utilitarian powers and possibilities and its unlimited producing effects. Now we found that this mind is not only all intelligence but all substance. How then is it to be differentiated in form? How are we to secure the effect which we desire? Ask any electrician what the effect of electricity will be and he'll reply that electricity is a form of motion and its effect will depend upon the mechanism to which it is attached. Upon this mechanism will depend whether we shall have heat, light, power, music, or any of the other marvelous demonstrations of power to which this vital energy has been harnessed. What effect can be produced by thought? Well, the reply is that thought is mind in motion, just as wind is air in motion, and its effect will depend entirely on the mechanism to which it is attached. Here, then, is the secret of all mental power. It depends entirely on the mechanism which we attach. Well, what is this mechanism? You know something of the mechanism which has been invented by Edison, Bell, Marconi, and other electrical wizards by which place and space and time have become only figures of speech. But did you ever stop to think that the mechanism which has been given you for transforming the universal, omnipresent potential power was invented by a greater inventor than Edison? We are accustomed to examining the mechanism of the implements which we use for tilling the soil and we try to get an understanding of the mechanism of the automobile which we drive. But most of us are content to remain in absolute ignorance of the greatest piece of mechanism which has ever come into existence, and that is the brain of man. Let's examine the wonders of this mechanism. Perhaps we shall thereby get a better understanding of the various effects of which it is the cause. In the first place, there is great mental world in which we live and move and have our being. This world is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. It will respond to our desire in direct ratio to our purpose and faith. The purpose must be in accordance with the law of our being. Now that is, it must be creative or constructive. Our faith must be strong enough to generate a current of sufficient strength to bring our purpose into manifestation. As thy faith is, so be it unto thee, bears the stamp of scientific test. The effects which are produced in the world without are the result of the action and reaction of the individual upon the universal. That is the process which we call thinking. The brain is the organ through all this process is accomplished. Now think of the wonder of it all. Do you love music, flowers, literature? Or are you inspired by the thought of ancient or modern genius? Remember, every beauty to which you respond must have its corresponding outline in your brain before you can appreciate it. There's not a single virtue or principle in the storehouse of nature which the brain cannot express. The brain is an embryonic world ready to develop at any time as necessity may arise. If you can comprehend that this is a scientific truth and one of the wonderful laws of nature, it will be easier for you to get an understanding of the mechanism by which these extraordinary results are being accomplished. The nervous system has been compared to an electric circuit with its battery of cells in which every force is originated and its white matter to insulated wires by which the current is conveyed. It is through these channels that every impulse or desire is carried through the mechanism. The spinal cord is the great motor and sensory pathway by which messages are conveyed to and from the brain. Then there is the blood supply plunging through the veins and arteries, renewing our energy and strength, the perfectly arranged structure upon which the entire physical body rests. And finally, the delicate and beautiful skin clothing the entire mechanism is a mantle of beauty. This, then, is the temple of the living God, and the individual I is given control, and upon his understanding of the mechanism which is within his control will the result depend. Now every thought sets the brain cells in action. At first, the substance upon which the thought is directed fails to respond, but if the thought is sufficiently refined and concentrated, the substance finally yields and expresses perfectly. This influence of the mind can be exerted upon any part of the body causing the elimination of any undesirable effect. A perfect conception and understanding of the laws governing in the mental world cannot fail to be of inestimable value in the transaction of business as it develops the power of discernment and gives a clearer understanding and appreciation of facts. The man who looks within instead of without cannot fail to make use of the mighty forces which will eventually determine his course in life and so bring him into vibration with all that is best, strongest, and most desirable. Attention or concentration is probably the most essential in the development of mind culture. The possibilities of attention when properly directed are so startling 
that they would hardly appear credible to the uninitiated. The cultivation of attention is the distinguishing characteristic of every successful man or woman and is the very highest personal accomplishment which can be acquired. The power of attention can be more readily understood by comparing it with a magnifying glass in which the rays of sunlight are focused. They possess no particular strength as long as the glass is moved about and the rays directed from one place to another. But let the glass be held perfectly still and let the rays be focused on one spot for any length of time and the effect will become immediately apparent. So with the power of thought, let power be dissipated by scattering the thought from one object to another and no result is apparent but just focus this power through attention or concentration on any single purpose for any length of time and nothing becomes impossible. Nothing becomes impossible. A very simple remedy for the very complex situation, some will say, All right, try it. You who have had no experience in concentrating the thought on a definite purpose or object, choose any single object and concentrate your attention on it for a definite purpose for even ten minutes. You'll find you can't do it. The mind will wander a dozen times, and it's going to be necessary to bring it back to the original purpose, and each time the effect will have been lost, and at the end of the ten minutes nothing will have been gained because you've not been able to hold your thoughts processes steadily to the purpose. It is, however, through attention that you'll finally be able to overcome obstacles of any kind that appear in your path, onward and upward, and the only way to acquire this wonderful power is by practice. Practice makes perfect in this as in anything else. In order to cultivate the power of attention, bring a photograph with you to the same seat in the same room in the same position as heretofore. Examine it closely at least ten minutes. Note the expression of the eyes, the form of the features, the clothing, the way the hair is arranged. In fact, note every detail shown on the photograph carefully. Now cover it and close your eyes and try to see it mentally. If you can see every detail perfectly and can form a good mental image of the photograph, you're to be congratulated. If not, Try repeating the process until you can. This step is simply for the purpose of preparing the soil. Next week, we'll be ready to sow the seed. Great financiers are learning to withdraw from the multitude more and more. And they may have more time for planning, thinking, and generating the right mental moods. Successful businessmen are constantly demonstrating the fact that it pays to keep in touch with the thought of other successful businessmen. A single idea may be worth millions of dollars. And these ideas can only come to those who are receptive, who are prepared to receive them, and who are in successful frames of mind. Men are learning to place themselves in harmony with the universal mind. They are learning the unity of all things. They are learning the basic methods and principles of thinking. And this is changing conditions and multiplying results. They are finding that circumstances and environmental trends follow the trends of mental and spiritual progress. Always the spiritual first, then the transformation into the infinite and illimitable possibilities of achievement. As the individual is but the channel for the differentiation of the universal, these possibilities are necessarily inexhaustible. Thought is the process by which we may absorb the spirit of power and hold the result in our inner consciousness until it becomes a part of our ordinary consciousness. The method of accomplishing this result by the persistent practice of a few fundamental principles, as explained in this system, is the master key which unlocks the storehouse of universal truth. These two great sources of human suffering at present are bodily disease and mental anxiety. These may be readily traced to the infringement of some natural laws. This is no doubt owing to the fact that so far knowledge has largely remained partial, but the clouds of darkness which have accumulated through long ages are now beginning to roll away and with them many of the miseries that attend imperfect information that a man can change himself, improve himself, recreate himself, control his environment and master his own destiny is the conclusion of every mind who is wide awake to the power of right thought in constructive action. Through all the ages man has believed in an invisible power through which and by which all things have been created and are continually being recreated. We may personalize this power and call it God, or we may think of it as the essence or spirit which permeates all things, but in either case the effect is still the same. So far as the individual is concerned, the objective, the physical, the visible, is the personal, that which can be cognized by the senses. It consists of body, brain, and nerves. The subjective is the spiritual, the invisible, the impersonal. 
The personal is conscious because it is a personal entity. The impersonal being, the same in kind and quality as all other beings, is not conscious of itself and has therefore been termed the subconscious. The personal or conscious has the power of will and choice and can therefore exercise discrimination in the selection of methods whereby to bring about the solution of difficulties. The impersonal or spiritual, being a part or one with the source and origin of all power, can necessarily exercise no such choice, but on the contrary it has infinite resources at its command. It can and does bring about results by methods concerning which the human or individual mind can have no possible conception. You will therefore see that this is your privilege to depend upon the human will with all of its limitations and misconceptions, or you may utilize the potentialities of infinity by making use of the subconscious mind. Here then is the scientific explanation of the wonderful power which has been put within your control, if you but understand, appreciate, and recognize it. Visualization is the process of making mental images, and the image is the mold or the model which will serve as a pattern from which your future will emerge. Make the pattern clear and make it beautiful. Don't be afraid. Make it grand. Remember that no limitation can be placed upon you by anyone but yourself. You are not limited as to cost or material. Draw on the infinite for your supply. Construct it in your imagination. It will have to be there before it will ever appear anywhere else. Make the image clear and clean cut. Hold it firmly in the mind and you will gradually and constantly bring the thing nearer to you. You can be what you will to be. This is another psychological fact which is well known, but unfortunately, reading about it will not bring about any result which you may have in mind. It won't even help you to form the mental image, much less bring it into manifestation. Work is necessary. Labor. Hard mental labor. The kind of effort which so few are willing to put forth. The first step is idealization. It is likewise the most important step because it is the plan on which you're going to build. It must be solid. It must be permanent. The architect, when he plans a 30-story building, has every line and detail pictured in advance. The engineer, when he spans a chasm, first ascertains the strength requirements of a million separate parts. They see the end before a single step is taken. So you are to picture in your mind what you want. You are sowing the seed, but before sowing any seed, you want to know what the harvest is to be. This is idealization. If you are not sure, return to the chair daily until the picture becomes plain. It will gradually unfold. First, the general plan will be dim, but it will take shape. The outline will take form, then the details, and you will gradually develop the power by which you will be enabled to formulate plans which will eventually materialize in the objective world. You will come to know what the future holds for you. Then comes the process of visualization. You must see the picture more and more complete. See the detail, and as the details begin to unfold, the ways and means for bringing it into manifestation will develop. One thing will lead to another. Thought will lead to action. Action will develop methods. Methods will develop friends, and friends will bring about circumstances, and finally the third step, or materialization, will have been accomplished. We all recognize the universe must have been thought into shape before it could ever have become a material fact, and if we're willing to follow along the lines of the great architect of the universe, we shall find our thoughts taking form just as the universe took concrete form. It's the same mind operating through the individual. There is no difference in kind or quality. The only difference is one of degree. The architect visualizes his buildings. He sees it as he wishes it to be. His thought becomes a plastic mold from which the building will eventually emerge, a high one or a low one, a beautiful one or a plain one. His vision takes form on paper and eventually the necessary material is utilized and the building stands complete. The inventor visualizes his idea in exactly the same manner. For instance, Nikola Tesla, he with the giant intellect, one of the greatest inventors of all ages, the man who has brought forth the most amazing realities, always visualizes his inventions before attempting to work them out. He did not rush to embody them in form and then spend his time in correcting defects. Having first built up the idea in his imagination, he held it there as a mental picture to be reconstructed and improved by his thought. In this way, he writes in The Electrical Experimenter, I am enabled to rapidly develop and perfect a conception without touching anything. When I have gone so far as to embody in the invention every possible improvement I can think of and see no fault anywhere, I put it into concrete, the product of my brain. 
Invariably, my device works, and as I conceived it should, in 20 years there's not been a single exception. Now, if you can consciously follow these directions, you'll develop faith, the kind of faith that is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You will develop confidence, the kind of confidence that leads you to endurance and courage. You'll develop the power of concentration, which will enable you to exclude all thoughts except for the ones which are associated with your purpose. The law is that thought will manifest in form, and only one who knows how to be the divine thinker of his own thoughts can ever take a master's place and speak with authority. Clearness and accuracy are obtained only by repeatedly having the image in mind. Each repeated action renders the image more clear and accurate than the preceding, and in proportion to the clearness and accuracy of the image, it will outline toward manifestation. You must build it firmly and securely in your mental world, the world within, before it can take form in the world without. And you can build nothing of value, even in the mental world, unless you have the proper material. When you have the material, you can build anything you wish, but make sure of your material. You cannot make broadcloth from shoddy. This material will be brought out by millions of silent mental workers and fashioned into the form of the image which you have in mind. Now think of it. You have over 5 million of these mental workers ready and in active use. They're called brain cells. Besides this, there's another reserve force of at least an equal number ready to be called into action at the slightest need. Your power to think, then, is almost unlimited, and this means that your power to create the kind of material which is necessary to build for yourself any kind of environment which you desire is practically unlimited. In addition to these millions of mental workers, you have billions of mental workers in the body, every one of which is endowed with sufficient intelligence to understand and act upon any message or suggestion given. These cells are all busy creating and recreating the body, but in addition to this, they are endowed with psychic activity whereby they can attract to themselves the substance necessary for perfect development. They do this by the same law and in the same manner that every form of life attracts to itself the necessary material for growth. The oak, the rose, the lily, they all require certain material for their most perfect expression, and they secure it by silent demand. The law of attraction, the most certain way for you to secure what you require for your most complete development. Make the mental image, make it clear, distinct, perfect. Hold it firmly. The ways and means will develop. Supply will follow. The demand you will be led to do the right thing at the right time and in the right way. Earnest desire will bring about confident expectation, and this in turn must be reinforced by firm demand. These three cannot fail to bring about attainment because the earnest desire is the feeling, the confident expectation is the thought, and the firm demand is the will. And as we've seen, feeling gives vitality to thought, and the will holds it steadily until the law of growth brings it into manifestation. Is it not wonderful that man has such tremendous power within himself, such transcendental faculties concerning which he had no conception? Is it not strange that we have always been taught to look for strength and power without We've been taught to look everywhere but within, and whenever this power manifested in our lives, we were told that it was something supernatural. There are many who have come to an understanding of this wonderful power and who make more serious and conscientious efforts to realize health, power, and other conditions, and they seem to fail. They don't seem to be able to bring the law into operation. The difficulty in nearly every case is that they're dealing with externals. They want money, power, health, and abundance but they fail to realize that these are the effects and can come only when the cause is found. Those who will give no attention to the world without will seek only to ascertain the truth. They will look only for wisdom, and they will find that this wisdom will unfold and disclose the source of all power, that it will manifest in thought and purpose which will create the external conditions desired. This truth will find expression in noble purpose and courageous action. Create ideals only. Give no thought to the external conditions. Make the world within beautiful and opulent, and the world without will express and manifest the condition which you have within. You will come into a realization of your power to create ideals, and these ideals will be projected into the world of effect. For instance, a man is in debt. He will continually be thinking about the debt, concentrating on it, and his thoughts are causes. The result is that he not only fastens the debt closer to him, but he actually creates more debt. He's putting the great law of attraction into operation, 
with the usual and inevitable result. Loss leads to greater loss. So what then is the correct principle? Concentrate on the things you want, not on the things you don't want. Think of abundance. Idealize the methods and plans for putting the law of abundance into operation. Visualize the condition which the law of abundance creates. This will result in manifestation. If the law operates perfectly to bring about poverty, lack, and every form of limitation for those who are continually entertaining thoughts of lack and fear, it will operate with the same certainty to bring about conditions of abundance and opulence for those who entertain thoughts of courage and of power. This is a difficult problem for many. We are too anxious. We manifest anxiety, fear, and distress. We want to do something. We want to help. We are like a child who has just planted a seed and every 15 minutes goes and stirs up the earth to see if it's growing. Of course, under such circumstances, the seed will never germinate. Yet this is exactly what many of us do in the mental world. So we must plant the seed and leave it undisturbed. This doesn't mean that we are to sit down and do nothing. By no means. We will do more and better work than we have ever done before. New channels will constantly be provided. New doors will open. All that is necessary is to have an open mind, so be ready to act when the time comes. Thought force is the most powerful means of obtaining knowledge, and if concentrated on any subject will solve the problem. Nothing is beyond the power of human comprehension, but in order to harness thought force and make it do your bidding, work is required. Remember that thought is the fire that creates the steam that turns the wheel of fortune upon which your experiences depend. Now ask yourself a few questions and then reverently await the response. Do you not now and then feel the self with you? Do you assert this self or do you follow the majority? Remember that majorities are always led, they never lead. It was the majority that fought tooth and nail against the steam engine, the power loom, and every other advance or improvement ever suggested. For your exercise this week, visualize your friend. See him exactly as you last saw him. See the room, the furniture. Recall the conversation. Now see his face. See it distinctly. Now talk to him about some subject of mutual interest. See his expression change. Watch him smile. Can you do this? All right, you can. Then arouse his interest. Tell him a story of adventure. See his eyes light up with a spirit of fun or excitement. Can you do all of this? Well, if so, your imagination is good. You are making excellent progress. After studying this part carefully, you will see that every conceivable force or object or fact is the result of mind in action. Mind in action is thought, and thought is creative. Men are thinking now as they have never thought before. Therefore, this is a creative stage, and the world is awarding its richest prizes to the thinkers. Matter is powerless, passive and inert. Mind is force, energy, and power. Mind shapes and controls matter. Every form from which matter takes is but the expression of some pre-existing thought. But thought works no magic transformations. It obeys natural laws. It sets in motion natural forces. It releases natural energies. It manifests in your conduct and actions, and these in turn react upon your friends and acquaintances, and eventually upon the whole of your environment. You can originate thought, and since thoughts are creative, you can create for yourself the very things you desire. And now part five. At least 90% of our mental life is subconscious, so that those who fail to make use of this mental power live within very narrow limits. The subconscious can and will solve any problem for us if we know how to direct it. The subconscious processes are always at work. The only question is, are we to be simply passive recipients of this activity, or are we to consciously direct the work? Shall we have a vision of the destination to be reached, the dangers to be avoided, or shall we simply drift? We have found that mind pervades every part of the physical body and is always capable of being directed or impressed by authority coming from the objective or from the more dominant portion of the mind. The mind which pervades the body is largely the result of heredity, which in turn is simply the result of all the environments of all past generations on the responsive and ever-moving life forces. An understanding of this fact will enable us to use our authority when we find some undesirable trait of character manifesting. We can consciously use all of the desirable characteristics with which we have been provided, and we can repress and refuse to allow the undesirable ones to manifest. 
Again, this mind which pervades our physical body is not only the result of hereditary tendencies, but it is the result of home, business, and social environment where countless thousands of impressions, ideas, prejudices, and similar thoughts have been received. Much of this has been received from others. The result of opinions, suggestions, or statements, much of it is the result of our own thinking, but nearly all of it has been accepted with little or no examination or consideration. The idea seemed plausible. The conscious received it, passed it on to the subconscious, where it was taken up by the sympathetic system and passed on to be built into our physical body. The Word has become flesh. This, then, is the way we are consistently creating and recreating ourselves. We are today the result of our past thinking, and we shall be what we're thinking today. The law of attraction is bringing to us not the things we should like or the things we wish for, or even the things someone else has, but it brings us our own, the things which we have created by our thought processes, whether consciously or unconsciously. Unfortunately, many of us are creating these things unconsciously. Now, if either of us were building a home for ourselves, how careful would we be in regard to the plans? How would we study every detail? How we should watch the material and select only the best of everything, and yet, how careless we are when it comes to building our mental home, which is infinitely more important than any physical home, as everything which can possibly enter into our lives depends upon the character of the material which enters into the construction of our own mental home. So what is the character of this material? We've seen that it is the result of the impressions which we have accumulated in the past and stored away in our subconscious mentality. If these impressions have been of fear, of worry, of care, or of anxiety, or if they've been despondent, negative, doubtful, well then the texture of the material which we are weaving today will be of the same negative material. Instead of being any value, it will be mildewed and rotten and will bring us only more toil and care and anxiety. We shall be forever busy trying to patch it up and make it appear at least genteel. But if we've stored away nothing but courageous thought, if we've been optimistic, positive, and have immediately thrown any kind of negative thought on the scrap pile, have refused to have anything to do with it, have refused to associate with it, or become identified with it in any way, what then is the result? Our mental material is now of the best kind. We can weave any kind of material we want. We can use any color we wish. We know that the texture is firm, that the material is solid, that it will not fade, and we will have no fear, no anxiety concerning the future. There is nothing to cover. There are no patches to hide. These are psychological facts. There is no theory or guesswork about these thinking processes at all. There's nothing secret about them. In fact, they are so plain that everyone can understand them. The thing to do is have a mental house cleaning and to have this house cleaning every day and keep the house clean. Mental, moral, and physical cleanliness are absolutely indispensable if we're to make progress of any kind. When this mental house cleaning process has been completed, the material which is left will be suitable for the making of the kind of ideals or mental images which we desire to realize. There is fine estates awaiting a claimant. Its broad acres with abundant crops, running water, and fine timber stretch away as far as the eye can see. There is a mansion, spacious and cheerful, with rare pictures, a well-stocked library, rich hangings, and every comfort and luxury. All the heir has to do is assert his heirship, take possession, and use the property. He must use it. He must not let it decay, for use is the condition on which he holds it. To neglect it is to lose possession. In the domain of mind and spirit, in the domain of practical power, such an estate is yours. You are the heir. You can assert your heirship and possess and use this rich inheritance. Power over circumstances is one of its fruits. Health, harmony, and prosperity are assets upon its balance sheet. It offers you poise and peace. It costs you only the labor of studying and harvesting its great resources. It demands no sacrifice except the loss of your limitations, your servitudes, your weakness. It clothes you with self-honor and puts a scepter in your hands. To gain this estate, three processes are necessary. First, you must earnestly desire it. Second, you must assert your claim. And third, you must take possession. You admit that those are not burdensome conditions. You're familiar with the subject of heredity. Darwin, Huxley, Hackle, and other physical scientists have piled evidence mountain high that heredity is a law attending progressive creation. 
It is progressive heredity which gives man his erect attitude, his power of motion, the organs of digestion, blood circulation, nerve force, muscular force, bone structure, and a host of other faculties on the physical side. There are even more impressive facts concerning heredity of mind force. All these constitute what may be called your human heredity. But there is a heredity which the physical scientists have not compassed. It lies beneath and antecedent to all their researches. At a point where they throw up their hands in despair and they say they cannot account for what they see. This divine heredity is found in full sway. It's the benign force which decrees primal creation. It thrills down from the divine, direct into every created being. It originates life, which the physical scientist has not done, nor can he ever do. It stands out among all forces supreme, unapproachable. No human heredity can approach it. No human heredity measures up to it. This infinite life flows through you. It is you. Its doorways are but the faculties which comprise your consciousness. To keep open these doors is the secret of power. Is it not worthwhile to make that effort? The great fact is that the source of all life and all power comes from within. Persons, circumstances, and events may suggest need and opportunities, but the insight, strength, and power to answer these needs will be found within. Avoid counterfeits. Build firm foundations for your consciousness upon forces which flow direct from the infinite source, the universal mind of which you are the image and likeness. Those we have come into possession of this inheritance are never quite the same. They have come into possession of a sense of power hitherto undreamed of. They can never again be timid, weak, vacillating, or fearful. They are indissolubly connected with omnipotence, and something in them has been aroused. They have suddenly discovered that they possess a tremendous latent ability of which they were heretofore entirely unconscious. This power is from within, but we cannot receive it unless we give it. Use is the condition upon which we hold this inheritance. We are each of us but the channel through which the omnipotent power is being differentiated into form. Unless we give the channel and is obstructed and we can receive no more. This is true on every plane of existence and in every field of endeavor and all walks of life. The more we give, the more we get. The athlete who wishes to get strong must make use of the strength he has. And the more he gives, the more he gets. The financier who wishes to make money must make use of the money he has, for only by using it can he get more. Now the merchant who does not keep his goods going out will soon have none coming in. The corporation which fails to give efficient service will soon lack customers. The attorney who fails to get results will soon lack clients, and so it goes everywhere. Power is contingent upon a proper use of the power already in our possession, What is true in every field of endeavor, every experience in life, is true of the power from which every other power known among men is begotten. Spiritual power. Take away the spirit, and what is left? Nothing. If then the spirit is all there is, upon the recognition of this fact must depend the ability to demonstrate all power, whether physical, mental, or spiritual. All possession is the result of the accumulative attitude of mind, or the money consciousness. This is the magic wand which will enable you to receive the idea and it will formulate plans for you to execute and you will find as much pleasure in the execution as in the satisfaction of attainment and achievement. Necessities are demands and demands create action and actions bring about results. The process of evolution is constantly building our tomorrows out of our todays. Individual development, like universal development, must be gradual with an ever-increasing capacity and volume. The knowledge that if we infringe upon the rights of others, we become moral thorns and find ourselves entangled at every turn of the road should be an indication that success is contingent upon the highest moral ideal, which is the greatest good to the greatest number. Aspiration, desire, and harmonious relations constantly and persistently maintained will accomplish results. The greatest hindrance is erroneous and fixed ideas. To be in tune with eternal truth, we must possess poise and harmony within. In order to receive intelligence, the receiver must be in tune with the transmitter. Thought is a product of mind, and mind is creative, but this does not mean that the universal law will change its modus operandi to suit us or our ideas, but it does mean that we can come into harmonious relationship with the universal, And when we have accomplished this, we may ask anything to which we are entitled, and the way will be made plain.